Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, Visioning for Prevention, Transforming Partnerships to Achieve Change. I will now turn it over to our facilitator, Nicole Barnes, to begin. Thanks, Chris. First and foremost, I, I want to welcome everybody. I'm going to spend a little bit of time introducing our featured speakers today. Uh, you'll hear today from Juliana Ormsby, our Center for States Region 10 liaison. She'll be facilitating our panel discussion a little bit later in the call. And then our team from Washington. We have Elise Morrissey, who is from the Children's Home Society of Washington, uh, Heather Cantamesa, who is also with the Children's Home Society of Washington, and Rob Wyman with Casey Family Program. We're glad to have you all here today. We're just going to go over the agenda and the objectives. Agenda 1. Review of Objectives and Introductions. Two, Parents for Parents Program in Alignment with Prevention Plan Goals. Three, Stories from the Field, How Agencies, Partners, and Families Work to Transform Systems. Four, Closing. And then we will jump right into our content. So our agenda today, uh, we're going to hear a little bit about the, the Parents for Parents program uh, from the Children's Home Society of Washington and really hear about how that program aligns with prevention plan goals. Uh, and then we're going to hear stories from the field, you know, from our team from Washington. How do agencies, partners, and, and families really work to transform systems? And then we'll have a little bit of closing towards the end, and then we will, uh, we will close out the call. So our objectives today, uh, we hope that you'll increase some awareness around how programs across the prevention continuum really can align with the Family First Prevention Services Act, the prevention plan development. We hope you'll increase your awareness of the process for gathering data on program effectiveness to really support applying for and getting approval for the Prevention Clearinghouse, and that you'll recognize the value of those critical partnerships between private providers, your TA networks, uh, state child welfare agencies, and other system partners to really support that transformational vision of what prevention looks like. So without further ado, I think I'm going to turn things over to Heather from the Washington team to get us kicked off. Overview and history of Children's Home Society of Washington's Parents for Parents program. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, Parents for Parents was created from the leadership of parent uh, Brenda Lopez, a, a parent with lived experience called a parent ally, in partnership with CASA GAL supervisor named Julie Lowry, uh, who recognized the value of parents' voice and peer support. This proactive and collaborative approach is reflective throughout the program model. Parents for Parents program elevates parents' voice from the bottom all the way up to the legislative level. History of Parents for Parents, P4P, program developed in 2005 by Parent Ally with strong child welfare court stakeholder support. Children's Home Society of Washington administers the program, owns the trademark, and provides startup and technical support. Program signed into law in 2015 and recognized as a statewide program. Creating the successful passage of P4P as a financially supported statewide program, further demonstrating the impact of our voice on decision making and our strong collaboration with stakeholders. Next slide. Overview of P4P, staffed by parent allies, locally led by the court or nonprofit. Early intervention prevention program. Three main components. Promising practice. Statewide in Washington, July 2021. Sites in Arizona and Missouri. Children's Home Society employs parent allies to administer and support all program sites and to work in partnership with each site's host organization. Strong child welfare stakeholder and judicial support is built to ensure program success. We meet parents at their court hearings and invite them to our Dependency 101 class and offer ongoing support throughout their case. We provide them with firsthand knowledge about how to successfully navigate the system and we are proof that not only does the system support reunification, it invests in our continued success. Children's Home Society supports 19 sites in 39 counties of Washington and has launched other sites across the U.S. Next slide. Benefits of P4P. 
instills hope in parents, promotes self-advocacy, connects to services, shifts the way parents perceive the agency and vice versa, addresses power and cultural dynamics, provides fulfillment and career advancement. P4P provides a roadmap for parents to use that is inspiring and achievable. We promote self-advocacy by educating parents about the system, Parent allies are well informed about child welfare services and closely connected to the most up-to-date resources in our community. The Dependency 101 class provides a platform for parents to understand how stakeholder roles uh, and, and how we strategically model how to have working relationships with professionals. We are translators of experience across social classes, bringing knowledge and, compa and compassion and understanding to both sides of the case. We reduce stigma that often diffuses adversarial perspectives by focusing on perceived control and common ground. P4P is a vehicle to build on parents' successes. When their case, when their case closes, the program is designed to assist them to transform their experience into practical, practical skills. As parents are lifted up into leadership positions, they strive to gain knowledge through continued education and training and move and often move into other opportunities to make a positive impact. And I'm going to turn it over to Elise. So you just heard about how Parents for Parents empowers families during one of the hardest times of their life. So I'm hoping to cover how we've been able to demonstrate the program's effectiveness. P4P recently underwent a long-term quasi-experimental multi-site evaluation conducted by the University of Nevada in the Capacity Building Center for Courts. Seventy percent of participants reunited in P4P group versus 53 percent in comparison group. Nineteen percent in P4P group had parental rights terminated versus 39% in comparison group. On the slide in front of you, you see that the entire program model is found to increase the likelihood of reunification by 26% and decrease in terminations by 20%. I also want to point out that participation in our one-time two-hour class increased reunification by 17% and decreased terminations by 13%. It's amazing how two hours of a parent's life can make a huge difference when they're met with compassion. Next slide, please. Multiple studies conducted. National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, Chapin Hall, University of Nevada, and the Capacity Building Center for Courts. In addition to the most recent evaluation, P4P has also underwent additional evaluations which found increased compliance with quartered services, increased attendance at hearings and visitation, and increased belief that parents have control over their case, amongst other things. Based on these findings, P4P is currently rated as a promising practice. We also submitted the program to be reviewed by the Title IV Prevention Services Clearinghouse in October 2019, although we're still waiting to be reviewed and very hopeful for this opportunity. I think it's also important to mention that parents in Washington have been at the table with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families regarding our state plan, and we have found them to be very receptive to hearing from parents. Although it's still early due to our waiting to be reviewed by the Clearinghouse, we are also still in conversation with our state leaders about potentially including P4P on our state's FFPSA plan. We're excited for what the future holds and hope to provide support to parents as early on as possible, and I also see this as a huge opportunity for other states interested in implementing um, a program model such as this. We're also currently in discussion about providing support at pre-filing at TDNs and hope to identify ways we can be in partnership with mandated supporters at schools, hospitals, and jails, and hopefully help prevent families from coming into the system. So that will close our overview of the program, and I will now turn it over to Juliana. Great. Thank you so much, um, Heather and Elise, for, um, for sharing an overview of the Parent for Parents uh, Mentoring Program, um, sharing a little bit about the research and, and that alignment with Family First. Um, so we're going to shift into digging a little bit deeper into the great work that you've been doing 
Um, we're welcoming Rob Wyman into the conversation with Heather and Elise, and I'll be asking all of you some questions. And again, just to share your experiences about your work, um, both directly providing services and, and as partners in this work. And so um, I want to explore in our first question um, about the relationships and partnerships that are needed to develop and implement um, this program. And so um, my first specific question, um, I'll start with Rob is um, if you could tell us some more about the drivers that laid the foundation for the success of this program. Thank you, Juliana. I think the, the, the beginning driver that has to exist in any, in any uh, jurisdiction looking to implement a program is the desire to improve engagement with parents and, and find success for parents and families. And when that happens and meets the, the, the lived experience, that authentic voice that parents bring, that's, that's really the original driver. That gets started. Um, speaking from Casey Family Program's perspective, uh, we began several years ago exploring practices that engage those with lived experience um, to make a difference for youth and families. Uh, peer, peer mentor networks and peer support really rose to the top in that process and really showed that it aligned with Casey Family Program's goals of delivering and improving and ultimately eliminating the need for foster care in our, in our child protection systems. Um, as you heard earlier uh, in the presentation, um, research is clear that the benefits to families, specifically their outcomes for children and reunifying, uh, have been established. And so it's, it's something that Casey Family Programs has really decided to invest in and support. Great. Thanks, Rob. Elise, I wonder what you'd add to that. What else can you share? Well, I think Heather mentioned a little bit about it, but I just think it's important to point out that the program began by a parent, is led by parents at the local level, and is administered by parents at the state level. So we have found this to be a key reason why the program is so successful, as well as the grassroots mobilization that's occurred by people who knew we needed to do more for families. Additionally, support and partnerships with many in the community who believe in the power of change and are full of compassion, like Rob, sorry to call you out, um, but that has been paramount, as well as parents finding purpose beyond a dependency case, like myself, who went from homelessness and incarceration to being a college graduate, serving families for over a decade. Many parents like myself and Heather got our start at P4P, so we're working to build that generative capacity in our communities by supporting programs like Parents for Parents. Great. Thanks, Elise. Um, so we've heard about some of the strengths and the drivers that go into supporting um, a successful program like this. And I want to shift to my next question around, um, can you tell us about some of the challenges? You know, how did your team persevere through these challenges? Um, I'll start with Heather and then we'll go back to Elise. I, I've heard of experiences and, and had personal experience myself with some of the new programs that have helped implement uh, being met with some skepticism and, and just challenges and concerns from, from stakeholders, but as we educated them on our supportive role and, and uplifted parents and demonstrated that our presence complement their work, they've become some of our strongest program supporters. No, that's great. Thanks, Heather. Um, Elise, what, what would you offer as well? Well, I would add that we know there's not only a need for this work, but the system issues can also seem overwhelming, especially for parents. So we see peer mentoring as a critical component to the solution. A huge issue I see is also identifying sustainable and startup funding for programs. But I've seen creative and passionate individuals exploring graded funding streams because of the difference maker this program is and because of the positive cost impact it's having on communities. Um, and then we also strive to reduce barriers to hiring and paying and honoring individuals with lived experience. So we partner at the local level to address barriers to make this happen. No, that's really great. Thank you. Um, I think we want to talk a little bit, too, about, um, and you alluded to this earlier um, in your presentation, Elise, but um, the alignment of the program, um, your program, with Family First, um, those core tenants and the goal of transforming child welfare. And so I um, want to talk a little bit about how does Parents for Parents align with the core tenants of Family First um, and that goal of transforming child welfare to a prevention-oriented system. 
uh, specifically thinking about using peer mentors in a prevention-oriented way. Um, Elise, I'm hoping you'll kick us off in this question. Sure. Well, P4P definitely shares some of the values I believe is at the core of FFPSA. It's research-based and focused on family success. It's a model that's responsive to families' needs. It's strengths-based. And our peer mentors provide understanding and compassion in order to move people into the solution. It's also skill-based, support-based, support and transformative with connecting families to community support. I would also mention it has the ability to draw immediate rapport and model for others why we need to invest in families, why this is so important, and also includes the training of professionals to shift mindset and potential stigma or bias towards parents. So I personally believe we need to see more peer mentor programs on the clearinghouse due to the significant impact we know it has for families. And it's going to really take all of us to be successful helping to shift away from a punitive mindset uh, that's currently at play in much of our system. Thanks, Elise. Rob, what would you add to that from your perspective? Well, in addition to just what I said earlier about Casey really examining you know, what's effective in this space and seeing parent mentoring programs, parent for parent specifically, uh, being one of those programs really rising to the top. Um, I kind of want to uh, emphasize a couple points that, that uh, Elise has just brought up and such and that I spoke to earlier about improving parent engagement. And I want to just identify that on two different levels. There's the idea of the prevention space and the person-to-person -person work in the prevention space. And in my experience, when you talk to anybody who works in that space, who engages families in the field, the idea of engaging families and enabling and empowering families to be able to engage the department during that kind of investigation or alternative response time and being able to really understand what's going on and bring themselves to the conversation, uh, parent mentorship and, and parent allies are just unbelievably valuable. Hopefully, we'll hear a little bit about that later. Um, and really building that, that engagement to the practice. There's then also the idea of elevating lived experience voice, in this case uh, uh, parents who have been through the system, into the decision making and design space because states are, are in the process, hopefully they're to the latter part of it, but you never know. They're in the process of designing and monitoring a prevention program in their state. And the, the voice of parents who have been in that sort of reception place of those services, being at the design table and, and helping the decision makers understand what that system needs is also a, a level of experience and expertise that you just really can't get anywhere else. And, and those are kind of two areas where um, Casey has really been uh, trying to help build those programs and build that capacity. Um, kind of bottom line, when you're, when you're going out in the prevention space, a lot of what you're doing is engaging and addressing trauma. And the one thing we know is that the way to do that is to bring empowerment. And uh, parent for parent, parent allies really bring in the potential to empower parents to be able to kind of meaningfully and securely engage in that prevention space rather than kind of be resistant and let what otherwise could have been diverted flow deeper into the system. Thanks, Rob. That's so important. I'm glad that you and Elise really emphasize the importance of engagement. That's kind of a core piece of, of the work that you do. We're talking about prevention. We know it's critical to engage at this juncture, but it's really critical to engage with parents and, and partners throughout um, throughout the life cycle of a case, right, the, across the spectrum. So thank you for, for kind of lifting that up. Um, and I think that leads us into our next question um, around uh, partner support. And so um, this question, I'll start with Elise first. Um, but what advice would you give to participants here who are struggling with building their capacity to engage their TA partners in this work? Uh, what are the kinds of supports that TA providers can offer states and partner organizations like Children's Home Society to align their programs like this with their state FFTSA prevention plans? So kind of a couple of questions, I guess, in there. But I'll start with you, Elise. I'll try to unpack it uh, briefly. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I would start just by saying by bringing parents, or our experience has been by bringing parents and other individuals with lived experience to the table to develop FFPSA plans. I believe you're not only helping to reduce unattended consequences by having the impacted populations at the table, but I also know states and technical assistance, 
um, individuals and whoever is at the table will also be inspired and motivated to make the necessary changes in order to promote family well-being. My agency uh, also provides technical assistance to launch new Parents for Parents programs. But what I also find is the result is a pool of parents are then developed who can work with state partners to make things better. I think we need to lean on one another to ensure peer work is happening in direct service programming with the training of professionals at advisory tables and with educating lawmakers. My advice is we really can't ever take for granted the power of a child being in their, the arms of their parents. Um, so we really need a partner to turn the vision of FFPSA into a reality. And if people ever need to be inspired, I have really cute children. I can share some pictures. <laughs> I can attest to that. I affirm that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Elise. Um, Rob, what would you share from the partner's perspective? From this partner, from Casey Family Program's perspective, what we've been doing is a couple of things. Uh, we've been focusing on sustainability and replication of parent partner programs. Uh, on the sustainability side, our national partnerships group hosted a series of webinars with peer programs talking about uh, how their programs are developed, they're funded, what are the gaps, what are the struggles that they're working on, and, and really building a, a peer supportive uh, element to their uh, work in keeping their programs going. We're really shifting now, I think, to a replication uh, set of work, um, and this being either uh, replicating a program from this state to another state or even within a state um, or U.S. territories and, we're, and tribal communities as well. Um, we hosted an external webinar back in May that really described uh, the research behind the programs and things like that, and hopefully similar to this program here, is kind of spreading the general word about uh, what, what and why these programs should be implemented in, in jurisdictions. We're also exploring TA opportunities, uh, technical assistance opportunities, um, by identifying kind of resource gaps and where we can kind of fit into that. Um, we've supported uh, concretely the development of programs in various sites around the country, including Maricopa and Pima County, Arizona, and Kansas City, Missouri. Um, we also, uh, at the end of last year, provided a grant to Children's Home Society to build its capacity to be a technical assistance provider outside of the state of Washington, similar to how, it, uh, how Children's Home Society is uh, set up inside Washington to provide TA to all the different jurisdictions inside the state. And that grant specifically calls for Children's Home Society to, to make itself, uh, to build itself up to be able to respond to TA requests to establish and maintain programs in state, you know, county, local county, state jurisdictions outside of Washington and in U.S. territories or tribal communities, including tribal communities in Washington. Um, that's really a, a kind of leading edge work that we're just looking to get into as well is uh, offering and, and supporting parent mentorship uh, in tribal courts and communities. That's great, Rob. Thanks. Um, and thanks to Children's Home Society for the work that you're doing to, um, to help other um, states and territories and tribes set up similar programs. So um, I know that we'll have materials um, and a link to your website that folks can, can access after this. So I'm going to shift back to Heather, um, and I hope um, you can share with us a little bit more about this concept of the science of hope that folks may be familiar with um, and how that plays a role in Parents for Parents and prevention as a whole. Yeah, the science of hope is embedded throughout the framework of the Parents for Parents program. In a nutshell, hope is the belief that your future can be brighter than your past and that you actually have a role to play in making it better. So according to the science, every goal has two main determinants. One, a person's level of agency, and two, access to the pathways to get there. So the program surrounds parents with cheerleaders that are relatable to them and, and they gain instant rapport with, uh, and, and then who also just sit beside them along the whole way throughout their journey in the child welfare system. And it 
provides pathways needed to get to their goal. And we do that through education and connecting to resources in the community. Not only do we broker the resources, but we have insider information about how to access those resources. So, and we even demonstrate how to connect with the resources. So when we model how to have working relationships with the community providers and stakeholders in the system, parents get that um, roadmap uh, and, and they get that, that demonstration and then they can try it on for themselves and use our modeling to uh, build their own skills with having working relationship, working relationships. Um, hope is, is measurable. And as parents have access to Parents for Parents and the benefits of the program, they gain the opportunity to build the willpower and the way power. Their hope scores rise, and that's an actual measurable thing, and, and they are significantly more likely to be successful. Next question. Yeah, sure. Um, so I wonder, Heather, um, if we can stick with you um, for this next question, of course, um, or if you can tell us how does the Parents for Parents program help to engage and support families in child welfare services? So by meeting parents as early as possible, we normalize their experience and dispel the shame that causes adverse reactions like lack of participation. We demonstrate direct mentorship behaviors like owning what we can control, and we share insider tips that empower and motivate parents to be successful. We stick with them, like I said, throughout their entire experience, and, and they have the choice of when they participate in the program. Um, we always assume that we are working with the parent that's going to make it. So along their journey, uh, we're training them to be managers of their own case and drive their case. And we know that we're going to recruit them to join our efforts in supporting other parents. So when they, act, when they achieve their goal and their case is closed, and this builds generative capacity like Elise referred to uh, before, uh, and it, it's really creating more of what we want, which is to safely reunify, preserve, and support families. And if, that, if I help one parent and they help two more parents and they help two more parents, we're really building in this, uh, this environment uh, to create more of what we want. And we see their confidence and success permeate into the other, all the other areas of their lives. Uh, so it's really about understanding the healing properties of support and self-advocacy and having opportunities, in which the Parents Thanks, for Parents Heather. program does a really good job of doing that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I know uh, it was referenced earlier that uh, Parents for Parents and similar programs are being expanded out to states, territories, and tribal communities. And I know you have experience working within tribal communities. So I wonder if you could tell us what's different about implementing prevention programs like Parents for Parents in tribal culture. So uh, the Parents for Parents program was successfully implemented and well received into a Western Washington tribal community. And they embraced the model and customized it to fit their traditions and system structure and community service array and even their native uh, language. Uh, and it was highly valued, but lost funding. Because we know the value of building relationships and working in collaboration with system stakeholders, uh, we follow the guidance of the community leaders and, and how the program will best serve their, the families in their system. Uh, they're the experts on their court structure and community, and we're the experts on the Parents for Parents program and how, to, it, how it creates support and parent leadership and implementation. So um, we, just, we always go into communities knowing that they're the experts and we're going to follow their lead. And um, yeah, they, have, they hold the key to what their community needs. 
No, that's great. Thanks for that. Um, so I wonder, as we start to close out this session, um, I have one more question for you, Heather. Um, I wonder if you have any other, if there's a feel-good story um, about Parents for Parents that you'd want to, to share with, with our audience. Absolutely. Um, it's a it's about Gina, who's a parent with lived experience, and she's doing mentorship work at the pre-filing level, so really early um, upstream work. For her, the goal is to connect moms and babies to the services and support they need while keeping them out of the court structure. And she notes that their willingness to do what it takes to stay together with their baby is evident and, and she sees a significant reduction in trauma when they're supported with options to stay together. So when Gina, uh, she meets with moms and explains her role and the support and resources she has access to, uh, the outcomes of other moms and that she's not affiliated with the agency, moms welcome her with open arms. So Gina was connected to a mom with a disability, a long history of DV, and the, just the inability to speak up for herself. Gina connected with this mom early during her pregnancy. Uh, the mom was convinced that she'd be separated from her child upon birth because that had happened for, to her before. Gina worked with her to empower her with support and programs and resources she attended. Uh, decision-making meetings, um, court hearings, support groups, and she helped her find shelter from intimate partner violence and assisted her to find safe, permanent housing. So she empowered her to develop, to develop self-advocacy, uh, self, sorry, self-efficacy and, and her voice. And not only has this parent never been separated from her baby, but she's actually reunified with another child after term had been filed. So I think that just demonstrates the power of having peer support and, and being delivered by a peer-led program um, to uh, really the outcomes that we see in, in our evaluation. Heather, I love that story about Gina. I also was thinking about something um, that has stayed with me over the years. So I hope to inspire us also to remember that lives are changed for the better through the power of someone who can tangibly instill hope. So I recall a father at court where his trajectory could have been very different as he was on the verge of yelling at everyone, which could have only stalled his great progress. It was hard for him to believe that his baby girl was okay, not in his care, because every time he saw her at a visit, she was in the same clothes that began to have more and more stains. So this was very important to him to address because he always made sure she was dressed beautifully each day she was with him, and he just did not feel hurt in the process. So as he was about to yell, I sat down with him and helped demonstrate that we can show them better than we can tell them, and that I personally knew the feeling of powerlessness as I began my case in shackles. So he told me for the first time he felt heard, motivated, and was validated as a direct result of support. He kept his eye on the prize. His baby came home quickly. He became a rock star parent mentor and now has a thriving career and family. It all began with the power of hope and education about the system. That's why we do this work, and that's why we need to collaborate to bring it to every family across the nation. Thank you. Thanking Heather and uh, Rob and Elise um, for your time today, and I'm going to be turning it over to Nicole to close this out. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. I, I appreciate it. God, I, I love hearing your inspiring stories. You all are, are doing such wonderful work, and thank you so much for, for sharing those stories with our participants in the audience today. I, I, hope that, I hope that our participants can take something away from the work that you're doing and be able to embed it in, in their core values and the work that they're doing in their states to really get to that holistic vision of prevention. So, Chris, if you could get us to the next slide, please.
So I just want to remind folks that uh, this is a, a three-part series around visioning for prevention. So this was the second event held in the three-part series. Event one was held in April on leading the charge for transformation, and it will be available on the center's website in the coming weeks. And then event number three, held in July, is an upstream approach to achieve prevention. And that also will be available probably towards the end of the summer on our website. I want to remind folks to stay connected with us. You can sign up for, uh, for our Gov delivery just to get general information from the center. Uh, you can also check out our new prevention webpage on our website that has a number of the resources that the center has developed, uh, including some tip sheets and guides around the Visioning for Prevention series. We have a publication called Working Across the Prevention Continuum to Strengthen Families, and then another one on Community Partnerships and Primary Prevention. That's a Children's Bureau Express article. So we'd love to have you check out the website and see what's new. Contact us https colon slash slash capacity dot childwelfare dot gov slash states slash email capacity info at icf dot com phone eight four four two 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 zero two seven two and then uh, lastly Chris if we could go to the last slide uh, I just want to remind folks to connect with us as, as they would like. Feel free to reach out to us at any time at the capacity info at icf.com uh, email address or our phone number there. We'd really love to hear from you. Uh, but thank you so much again for listening to today's session and uh, have a wonderful afternoon.